So yeah, we'll get started because we have a lot to discuss and um, only a little over an hour to cover a lot of um, important topics. Um, my name is Miriam Diaz. I'm uh, representing Urgent Action Fund for Women's Human Rights. Uh, we are a um, feminist fund uh, that has been supporting women and trans human rights defenders for over 20 years. We're also a member of Protect Defenders Consortium, which is a membership-based consortium focusing on uh, protecting human rights defenders around the world. Um, before I get started, um, before we get started with our amazing panel, um, we uh, I wanted to just uh, bring us back a little bit uh, and set the tone for this for the session in terms of why we're here um, and uh, and uh, what is it that we're uh, going to discuss what is the goal here today um, I really appreciate uh, uh, all of you being here uh, given that there are a lot of other amazing panels so uh, thank you again for coming um, so um, you're here, you're all here um, because you're interested, I'm assuming so, about to learn about uh, protection mechanisms for women and trans human rights defenders. Uh, specifically, uh, as it says in the title, what does it mean uh, when protection mechanisms actually work? And we have an amazing lineup of panelists who will speak from their experience uh, uh, many of them being funded through Protect Defenders. Uh, from their experience, uh, what worked for them and what are some uh, ongoing challenges? Um, as we know, politically, there's just ongoing increasing uh, repression and uh, increasing surveillance. Um, and the challenge is how do we maintain protection and our commitment to human rights while continuing our commitments to development goals. Um, so just quickly, um, Protect Defenders uh, is a consortium that it's been established about two and a half years ago and funded uh, through the European Union um, and uh, we've supported over 11,000 defenders in the last two and a half years. Um, So you can see uh, the names of the organizations that are uh, members of this consortium. Um, I won't name them all, but some of my colleagues uh, are here, um, and I encourage you to chat with them after the panel uh, to learn more. But uh, this is a very important mechanism. Um, as I said, we've supported a great number of activists, including women and trans and intersex activists. Um, we are uh, the key uh, approach that we're utilizing is being flexible. We strive to be flexible uh, in both approaches and uh, understanding of protection. Uh, we're continuing to learn. Um, also, uh, on your seats, there are cards with uh, pens uh, and dots for your questions throughout the session, and then um, we'll collect them and um, ask the questions. Uh, at the end of the session. So uh, please um, write down your questions. Before we proceed, we were hoping to do a little exercise and utilize technology that's being offered in this space. So um, how many of you have the app? All right, that's good enough. <laughs> so what I'd like you to do is to go on your app and um, select Shape the Debate option and then under there you'll see interactive tools um, and then you click on word cloud and then you choose room s3 so um, all right everyone is ready yeah? All right, so, so we're going to give it a minute. Uh, the question that we're asking is, in one word, describe what you think when you hear human rights defender. Again, in one word, describe what you think when you hear human rights defender. So we have 
justice, courage, fighter, resilience, development, plan, rights. Speaking out, and mobilizer, change, danger. Great, thank you. <laughs> so, um, so all these words, I think, are indicative of what uh, human rights defenders have to deal with. And I think they're also indicative of, and essentially, the threats that they're constantly facing to do the work they're doing. Um, and I think um, specifically when we're talking about women and trans and intersex activists, uh, we're also talking about what it means to be, to have a gendered aspect uh, in your protection needs, uh, because that is also specific um, to them. Um, so now I wanted to, before we proceed to the panel, I wanted to um, pull up slide three on the definition of uh, women human rights defenders so that we have a kind of a common understanding of um, what a woman human rights defender who, who, the, who they are and uh, why they're called Women Human Rights Defenders. And s slide three, please. So uh, I'm not gonna read it out, so you can see um, the definition there. That's kind of like our working definition. Um, but uh, what I wanted to point out is that uh, when we're talking about uh, how we define uh, an activist, a woman activist, we also have to keep in mind that it's um, increasingly expanding, constantly shifting definition because uh, a lot of women we work with, for example, don't self-define themselves as human, women human rights defender or activists. Um, also, we have to think about technologies and digital activism and women bloggers uh, who are doing amazing work but may not be associated with the traditional notions around um, the women human rights defender community uh, we also have an increasing number of defenders, activists in the diasporic communities. Um, so essentially once they left the country, the, the activism that continues. Uh, so all these um, uh, aspects are important to think about as you're working with um, women activists. So now let's move to our panel. Um, I'm going to ask a round of questions. Uh, and I'll start with um, Aigirin Kamidola, who is here with us from an organization, um, a feminist initiative from Kazakhstan called Feminita. Um, so Aigirin, uh, my first question to you is, um, so Feminita focuses specifically on promoting the rights of uh, LBQT women in Kazakhstan. Can you share a bit about the political and legal context you're operating in, and what are some main challenges? Yeah, thank you for the welcome and um, introduction. Um, the question is really relevant, and um, uh, yeah, I would say, yeah, I would say that um, Minita has been working for monitoring the advocacy of uh, rights of LGBTQ women in Kazakhstan for about three years, and it's been a, a challenging um, environment the organization has been working and I would I would group those challenges in like three groups. So firstly I would say that the overall repressive climate for um, for civil society and activists, especially for um, women, feminists and LGBTQ uh, activists. And this includes uh, restrictive legislation, um, NGO legislation restricted legislation on like peaceful assembly and association, um, freedom of speech, um, abuse of like anti-terrorist and anti-extremist um, legislation by the state, where the state would use those um, officially illegal um, means to um, silence dissent or any non-conforming groups, including feminist LGBT groups. Um, so, for example, um, on our case of Feminita, we've been working for three years and um, 
we work as an, an unregistered uh, entity uh, because we've been trying to register uh, and obtain a legal status, but our uh, application has been constantly rejected. And the official reply uh, by the justice uh, institution is that the objectives of the of the organization does not conform with uh, Article 4 of the law on NGOs of Afghanistan. Uh, but this is quite ambiguous grounds because um, the Article 4 provides an inexhaustive list of objectives the organization can work on. And, um, so we did, and um, we asked ICNL, Independent Center for uh, Non Commercial Law to conduct an uh, independent expertise of our uh, application and supporting documents, but, uh, uh, but the, the outcome was uh, that documents are okay, and uh, the only recommendation was maybe to neutralize and reform the wording on objectives, so that it would be more conforming and acceptable by the state. So as a result, what we operate this um, uh, in this climate where we actually cannot register and obtain the legal uh, status and as a result um, open a bank account or uh, have a salary for our staff, uh, apply for funds, apply for institutional funds. So we, so we have to apply either for individual grants or uh, seek for financial uh, partner organization our projects through that um, yeah, and um, this comes on the back against the backdrop of other um, things um, like the secondly is the situation with women's rights in the country overall um, where the state acknowledges the women's rights but defines the women very narrowly as exclusively mothers and caregivers and if, uh, and design all the uh, programs uh, where uh, the paramount role in the society of women would be reproductive or caregiving role. And thirdly, and most importantly for our organization, is highly uh, high and extreme uh, homophobia and state-sponsored homophobia where the state does not have a positive obligation under local legislation uh, to protect against discrimination and hate crimes based on certain sexual orientation and gender identity despite the uh, um, official recommendations issued by the uh, UN Rights Committee and um, by that the state sends a strong signal for the society and any, anyone um, by its inaction and silence to the sanctions violence and hate towards activists uh, who work on feminist and LGBT issues. Thank you, Aguilim. Um, and I just wanted to add, um, just in terms of the context of Kazakhstan, uh, as you probably know, it's a very resource-rich country with oil and gas and other resources, so there's a lot of investment going on from uh, Global North based uh, companies, including companies from the EU region. Um, so it's an interesting dichotomy because there's so much investment uh, and it's developing, uh, uh, well developed, but uh, considered at this point middle income country. But uh, what does it mean when we're thinking about human rights violations and um, supporting human rights in this country? Um, and then, um, so, my second question is also do I get in because um, the case the, the 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 case that was supported through Protect Defenders uh, is a very important case um, of what's called public shaming of a young lesbian couple when a video of them was posted online, uh, which is a very common tactic uh, in uh, Central Asia and other parts of the former Soviet Union. Um, where videos are posted not just by organized groups but ordinary citizens, sort of the watchdogs of morality. Um, 
So Aguirin, can you share with us a bit more about this case and why um, it was uh, why it's an important case from the perspective of LGBT rights and women's rights? Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, the case, uh, we consider the case uh, as being a strategic case. So it's uh, uh, the, one of the first strategic litigation cases our organization is supporting and it's, uh, as Miriam told, uh, concerns to uh, lesbian women who, um, who were caught by a stranger um, kissing and uh, the stranger filmed and then put up a video on his um, social media. Uh, platforms with the public access, revealing their identities, uh, uh, and most importantly, with a with with an open incitement for hate for like for the immediate relatives of the women and wider society to correct and maybe to to correct before it's not too late. So um, yeah, and then um, this. Um, um, yeah, so this post got a very, uh, it caught its height and um, there was a very high view uh, numbers and um, and it was picked up on the, uh, by the media uh, outlets and there was a lot of hate in the media and this is important to note that um, in the country where there's almost uh, no independent media outlets uh, the public discourse uh, remains in its majority uh, increasingly um, homophobic. So if you see the, the news media uh, posting on the subject, and it would be uh, homophobic, but then you know that, that there's no, almost no existing in the media. So it's actually, even the public officials would be um, um, silent but the media would go would do the dirty job so to speak so that's why we decided to to pick up the case because it's not the first I and mean, it's not the last one but um with the support of urgent action fund and protect defenders uh we uh, provided a legal um support for the case so the, the incident took place in february and we filed uh, the case in the end of february and, um, and the, the court hearing uh, was delayed three times but, um, because the, the perpetrator did not show up. But the, the court uh, demonstrated the tolerance to that party. And finally, the court hearings in two sessions commenced in, in May and, um, and it uh, delivered the deliver the, the judgment uh, which uh, which satisfied the, the claim and uh, the claim partly so um, what we could see is that the state did not it, it satisfied the part of the uh, in partly the fine part but, um, but on the other hand it did not it, 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 did, it did not really uh, fact of discrimination because discrimination is not a protective ground and um, and also uh, in a public discourse there is no existent discrimination so public officials is, uh, or media tries to avoid the word as if it does not exist so in the slides you could actually see the the, the, the screenshots from the from the social media pages and also from the media, where the media actually is in Russian, but, but it shows that uh, how the media portrays the, the perpetrator as a guardian of the traditional family values versus the, the lesbian couple who actually is in search of hunting for fortune or uh, of this. Uh, of this guardian man who, um, and yeah, they, they want to like uh, get a five to find him for like five million, which is not, which is not the, the, the objective, of course, because they want their freedom and rights. So say that, see that this is the traditional values versus the, the yeah, the homophobic 
they um, yeah, got a public attitude as a false perpetrator and his advocate. Thank you, Aydirim. Um And I'll just <laughs> add, because I was working on this case with them, is uh, um, what we, um, what the struggle is also in the post-Soviet state, because registration is still, a lot of it is um, kind of left over from the Soviet period. And there's uniformity among the republics uh, in terms of what's missing. Um, and one of the missing pieces is legislation around um, anything related to social media information on social media, freedom of association, freedom of speech, uh, privacy rights. Uh, so there's a lot of struggle around that. Um, and so this is a precedent setting case because that can help to test it out. How are courts responding? Um, are there actually lawyers interested in working on this? And so it's kind of a, you know, a, a tryout. Um, and that's why it's important. And again, these trends are very common all across in terms of just regular citizens uh, trying to videotape um, uh, others and post them online. Uh, um, now I'd like to move to um, Wayam, uh, Wayam Youssef. Um, she is um, uh, representing the Gulf Center for uh, Human Rights. Um, and uh, the question for Wayam is, um, so we are the Nena region is rife with political instability um, and legacy of conflicts and human rights violations. It continues to suffer one of the worst humanitarian crises um, since the World War II. So in this context, what are some specific creative strategies that women human rights defenders in the region are utilizing? Um, thank you for setting the context for this. I think it's very important to acknowledge the fact that um, MENA region is one of um, uh, the most volatile and, and um, um, facing a very uh, serious humanitarian and human rights um, uh, crisis at, uh, at the moment. Um, uh, during the global political and economical and social uh, disruption, uh, new wars are evolving, um, unresolved conflicts are still on, and we have a legacy of uh, human rights violation. Um, uh, there is also rising sense of fundamentalism, radicalism, and nationalism, uh, which making um, uh, the role of women human rights uh, defenders very essential, but at the same time a very um, challenge. Um, uh, the, the advocacy in MENA region is constantly challenged by multiple internal and external factors, as well as uh, various um, state and non-state actors. Um, so we, we've been witnessing recently a crackdown in Saudi Arabia uh, on women human rights defenders. Um, while Saudi authorities are um, um, are presenting themselves as, as making a reform and advancement on, on, on women's rights, um, they are still targeting those who are uh, calling for women's rights in Saudi Arabia. For example, we have Lujain uh, Hadloul uh, and Iman Nejifan who are very prominent, uh, prominent women human rights defenders working on the rights of women. Um, they've been leading um, the right to drive, the, the, um, the guardianship uh, campaigns, and, and they've been um, uh, under the focus of media. And they knew that they would be targeted for their work, um, and, and they, um, they notified their, their networks of, of the kind of uh, targeting they would be subjected to and the kind of threat uh, they would be um, uh, potentially uh, put in. Um, and after um, participation uh, of uh, um, Imam uh, and uh, Lujain in, in Sida, uh, both of them, a uh, few, few months after, uh, they've been uh, detained. And now they are held in unknown places and their cases is really um, hard to investigate because um, the authorities are um, accusing them of treason. Um, we believe these uh, serious accusations are mainly um, to, to um, not only to, to um, ruin their reputations, but also to set an example for everyone who's um, daring to speak uh, for women's rights. Um, um, this is one example of, of what's happening for women's rights, um, women's rights activists in, in, in the MENA region. 
In Syria, for example, uh, we have also women who have been very active in besieged area, like Eastern Ghouta. Um, we have um, one uh, woman, who her name is uh, Nivin Hatsuri. Nivin was very active on social media. She was documenting um, everything that's happening. She was challenging the authorities, the Syrian authorities. She was challenging the armed groups, and she, she's been working um, very actively with other women uh, using social media. She challenged the status quo and, and the, the closing of civic space um, and the being trapped in, 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 in a shelter, underground shelters or tunnels or wherever they've been um, uh, uh, staying in, uh, in, in such circumstances, and they created this kind of um, collective network online. Um, these are some of the mechanisms women in such circumstances are using. Um, they uh, depend on solidarity as one of the main um, uh, tools. Um, they also depend on networking for resourcing their um, work, their movements, as well as um, uh, uh, developing their own preventative and, and protection mechanisms uh, based on best practices and shared experiences. Uh, I mean, uh, um, it's not easy to be uh, operating and working in such environment where everyone is against you um, and, and nothing is helping. I mean, sometimes in, in such um, um, spaces, it's really hard to navigate the right resources and to be able to access to, to, to help, to fund. And a lot of the things that we think is probably available uh, for them. So they've been very creative in, in terms of uh, being supportive to each other and, and being there for each other, helping with information, helping with um, 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 disseminating some of of, of uh, the, the the kind of targeting they've been subjected to, so in order to um, to to avoid in the future um, any kind of such things happening for other people uh, like them. Um, at the end, I, I would say that uh, women find the strength in solidarity. Uh, protection comes um, in in these extremely closed spaces and in in so many forms and shapes that's very innovative and beyond our imagination. Um, they've been forced to be creative and in, in, in creating such mechanisms. And I think um, um, while sitting with these women, you would um, come to conclusion that most of the treaties, the resolutions, the, 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 the diplomatic kind of um, wordy, uh, very long, uh, treaties and, and mechanisms in, in place are, are really nothing compared to the circumstances they've been to. Um, I think there's a need for tailoring um, and talking about any of the protection mechanisms that are feasible and, uh, and effective. Thank you, William. Um, um, yeah, it's an important reminder of, based on what you just said, is um, how protection is very much self-defined thing. There isn't uh, one model, and especially from a gendered perspective, we always um, advocate for this notion that uh, it's up to women defenders to to tell us what they need. Um, but I also remembered what um, Wiyam shared with me last night is um, when you're in a situation with uh, constant threat, as in uh, the war in Syria, Sometimes it's up to us, those who support defenders, to come up with solutions and not say, oh, okay, we can support you, but what do you need? Because it's nearly impossible to even have uh, the space and time to, to, to think thoroughly about what the needs are. So it's because they're so basic, it's being safe. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, so now I'd like to switch to Emily DeWolf. Um, she is uh, here with us from Oaxaca, Mexico. She's um, with an organization called Consortia. Um, so Emily, you've been focusing on designing protection uh, responses in the context of Latin America for many years now. Um, you're also raising awareness around the need for feminist approaches to protection. Um, can you please share what does it mean to apply a feminist lens to protection? Thank you, Miriam. 
perspective. I would just like to start telling that right now, as many of you <coughs> might know, Mexico is in an election context and is facing one of the most bloody election contexts in history. So this context affects uh, particularly human rights defenders and journalists. The election will take place on July 1st and it's really important that international community can be can can watch the situation and can also pronounce because the the assassinations are like impossible to count uh, there are more than 100 until now and the election did not even take place so uh, i just wanted to uh, to start uh, remembering this and switching to the the, the question you just asked me marim uh, Yes, I am coming from the NGO called Consorcio Oaxaca, who is working on protection mechanism and protection with a feminist perspective since 2010. And we are part of the Mesoamerican Initiative of uh, Women Human Rights Defenders. Uh, we are also part of the National Network of Women Human Rights Defenders in Mexico, and we are also uh, coordinating local networks in the state of Oaxaca and regional networks. Uh, I want to, to say that um, uh, everything I am I'm sharing is uh, also built on the, this collective experience uh, with the Mesoamerican Initiative and all the other networks. Because I think one key point uh, for protection is, is, is networks. Because what we say in the Mesoamerican Initiative and the, the other networks is that networks save lives. We cannot... Uh, put protection and security in the hands of other people. One of the main um, learnings we have is that when you, when you propose protection measures, you should, um, you should think of the measures that you would like to, to have, exactly as William was, was talking about. Um, there is no receipt, and something that I think is really a, a, like one of the the uh, uh, a good uh, practice of Consortium Oaxaca and all the other NGOs that are working on, on this is that we are proposing and accompanying uh, the same way as we would like us to be treated. And actually, we are also facing risk. We have also uh, faced threats, like in, uh, just to mention uh, one issue, like in the last half, in a year and a half, we, we had six in eruption in uh, the office or in personal houses of uh, some members of the NGO and I think that helps us to understand the impact the, and, and to also, well, not talk like, uh, okay, I, I, I will tell you what to do, but uh, to, want to understand how to construct collectively. And that's why I think it's so important, the, the, the work of uh, Protect Defenders that is also built as a network uh, of uh, several NGOs that are locally based it sometimes and that you, you can construct responses, protection responses very quick and with this uh, alliance and confidence that you could not find in other, uh, in other options because as you, as you might know in, in Mexico there, there are lots of governmental mechanisms to, to, that propose protection but what we, what we find is that when some women human rights defenders is at risk the, the way to, to protect her life is to start with the local response with her allies and in between the networks of, of, of ourselves, the women human rights defenders, with other allies like protect defenders and other, uh, other NGOs or um, mechanisms that can, that can help, but the protection might, will never come uh, from a governmental entity. Um, something uh, that is really important with a, f from a feminist point of view is that when you talk about protection, you must um, understand sustainability as the key, the, the, the key issue. It, it, has the cent it, it is in the center because um, protection is about to be able to do your work in good conditions. You know? It's not about to 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 resist and to be like like this now in this position all the time, but to create condition to be able to work and to work at uh, uh, in, in in a long period of time, 
and, and that is really one of the center points we start when we construct m uh, protection measures. And it's also important to, to take as a principle self-care as a political act. No, it, it's really connected to what I, I just uh, told, but really, uh, when, we, when we talk about uh, protection, we, talk it at, uh, we define it as um, well-being in action, no? as a being able to do your work in good conditions. It, obviously, we, you will always face risk when you, when you, do, uh, when you work on, on human rights defense in contexts like uh, Mexico, Oaxaca, and Mesoamerica, but it is important to, to, to open the space of, of, of working and, and be beginning to talk also about self-care as something really uh, crucial. Uh, some uh, really briefly other points I wanted to raise is it, it is important when you talk about protection to also understand that even if the main aggressors uh, come from the states, sometimes there are other issues, really complex issues inside the social movement, inside uh, the, the um, families that are also reproducing gender, um, gender violence and that will also impact on protection of women human rights defenders. So when you want to, uh, to help and to construct protection measures, you need to, to understand that and not just think about, okay, I will give you money for uh, putting a camera, putting a security in your house and all those obvious measures, but also understand that maybe uh, working on psychosocial aspects of uh, the the relation that the human rights defenders, the women human rights defenders has with her daughter, uh, it it might be crucial to 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 bring protection to her and also to her daughter because obviously in most of the cases the the aggressor don't just um, aggress the mother but also the the, the daughter. No, it is. Um, uh, a specificity in, uh, in women's cases that they, they, the, the attacks often come to the children. Um, and also, yeah, to, to, to understand and visualize uh, violence inside social movements, also to understand that, uh, as also Agarim was, was uh, mentioning, women, human rights defenders, almost never uh, receive a salary for the work they do. And that's really different uh, uh, as in the cases of men. Women must, uh, they are uh, raising their children, they are defending human rights, and they also must find some money to, to, to be able to, well, to, to live. No? So it's really important to, to look at protection, understanding all those specificities. Uh, and one final point I wanted to to say is that really, and as you, you mentioned before, protection must be understood as a very, very flexible uh, issue. And when you want to to think about it, you must uh, reflect uh, have a reflection on okay, the attacks that a women human rights defender suffer. What is the aim of the attacks? No? Not just like looking at the fact, but also what what are the aggressors uh, looking for? And for instance, I want to mention in the case of Oaxaca, we, uh, as in the case uh, specific case of, of my NGO Consortium Oaxaca, but also another 12 uh, human rights defenders, 11 women human rights defenders, have suffered um, robberies in, uh, in house robberies, no, or in the uh, office uh, intrusions, and when this is done, it has it has an intimidation purpose, or uh, stealing information purpose, but also trying to have an impact on the sustainability of the of your work. So stealing your your computer and other uh, things that you use to work. It, the the aim is also to 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 make you impossible to to work no so uh, when you think about protection you must understand that and and if an NGO is is uh, asking you an NGO women human rights defenders organization collective is asking you to fund those kind of issues it, it's not that okay if I, I need you to fund my work but how can you also uh, look at the the purpose of the aggression. And, and and understand why the the measures are asked. Thank you. Um, thank you, Emily. Um, yeah, just would encourage all of you to um, 
talk to Emily after the panel because uh, the work that she's done in Consortio and uh, Mesa American Initiative, there's a lot of incredible work around understanding protection for women. And also, uh, an our end at Urgent Action Fund, um, I've used a lot of their resources for understanding how to make uh, self-care a political act for those of us who support human rights defenders um, in terms of maintaining our own well-being because we have the responsibility to do so um, as those who support them. Um, so just something to, to think about as well. Um, now I'd like to uh, turn to Christine, um, my dear son, um, who is uh, providing a pivotal role in supporting human rights defenders within the Office of Director General for International Cooperation and Development at the European Commission. Um, Christine, so the question for you is, can you share with us what the European Commission uh, has been doing to ensure support for human rights defenders and women's human rights defenders? Um, and in your perspective, what is the most urgent priorities right now to ensure uh, ongoing support? Thank you very much. And thank you for these very inspiring interventions. Uh, I hope I will be as inspiring as you. But as, as we saw, um, women human rights defenders do play an increasing preeminent role civil society movements and in the human rights and governmental sector. We see that besides the obstacles that uh, human rights defenders face, uh, women human rights defenders do face gender specific or gender based obstacles, threats, restrictions. Um, those are uh, not only because they work on the promotion of gender equality and, and women's rights, um, because more uh, widely they challenge traditional values, they may challenge uh, some of the uh, gender stereotypes uh, and be the promoters of what we hear, the gender theory. Uh, so, um, for example, we, we, have, we have seen that uh, uh, women working on defending victims of, of domestic violence, or those robotic uh, sexual and reproductive health rights were, were uh, targeted in this, in this spectrum. Uh, but again, um, uh, women, uh, uh, women human rights defenders may be targeted uh, sometimes from uh, their own communities or families just because they play a leading role and it's not always accepted as well internally, so not only because uh, what they advocate or what they promote, but also the place, just by, by uh, occupying an important place and a leading place in a movement. So that's, that's important to also uh, understand the multiform threat and challenge that, that they face, as we call, by, by the different speakers. Um, so as a result, they, we see that uh, they, they face sometimes an unequal access to resource, uh, to networks, to protection mechanisms, to also formal, uh, formal ways of, of protecting themselves. Uh, sometimes, again, um, we, hear, we hear that women human rights defenders um, uh, do complain that even within the human rights movement or uh, from fellow human rights defenders, uh, their work or um, issues related to gender equality or women's rights are not being considered as acute human rights issues, as perhaps we hear soft human rights issues, uh, which, uh, which is of course far from being the, uh, the truth. But um, so there is a, a multiform battle here to, to, uh, to lead uh, from the side of, of women human rights defenders. Uh, we mentioned that they are, uh, again, uh, exposed to uh, gender-based, I mean, specific violence, whether it's the threats or actual acts of sexual violence. Uh, whether uh, if this is targeted threats to their families and to their children, uh, more exposition to acid attacks, as we saw for, for, for some women human rights defenders, um, and specific violence from their partners, um, as it may be the case, sadly. Um, so in this context, when we see the rising role of, of, uh, of women human rights defenders, their importance uh, uh, in the human rights movement, and the important needs that they have, 
they seem to benefit less from the protection mechanisms and from financial and other resources that are allocated to hum human rights defenders. Uh, from our modest experience, we see that they are a minority from the programs and the, and the funds we, we support uh, in benefiting uh, uh, from, from this from this multiform support. So here there is there is a definite work to do uh, uh, together with women human rights defenders so that they are also able to benefit from formal or informal um, protection programs. Um, Indeed, there is a, 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 we see that women human rights defenders, of course, they request and they benefit from the, the mainstream, I mean, the, the, the usual and classical measures of protection, but, but sometimes they may be more uh, 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 demanding or requesting some specific form of medical treatment, psychosocial assistance, but not only for them, but also for their families. Uh, and, and specific support for family members and, and other type of support. But um, that's, that's, that's also very, we start to see that some kind of uh, specific requests are, are coming through. So coming to the, to the EU support, because of course the European Commission is not alone, uh, it's very much a, a firm EU engagement in favor of human rights defenders, uh, both at the, at the level of the policy uh, and at the level of, of, uh, of instruments and concrete tools and funding. So uh, I prefer to talk about uh, an EU response and engagement uh, in favor of, of, uh, of human rights defenders and in favor of their protection. So we are all, I mean, many of you are familiar with uh, some of the classical policy documents, such as uh, the EU Action Plan on, on, on uh, Human Rights and Democracy, the EU guidelines on, on, on uh, human rights defenders, uh, and um, uh, some of the some of the policies that we also promote within the EU, whether it's a human rights-based approach to our uh, policies and, and uh, activities or uh, mainstreaming gender equality within our our program. So there is a there is a definite engagement in terms of concrete programs. Um, you are familiar with ProtectDefenders.eu, which is. Um, Indeed, this consortium of, of 12 NGOs, which is funded from the European Instrument for Democracy and Human Rights. This is a, a three-year project, but the, the very existence of a human rights defenders mechanism is something that is uh, going uh, uh, further, of course, this project and these three years. And uh, looking at the future, we uh, uh, this, the, the existence of a of protection uh, mechanisms is something which should be envisaged on a, on a, on a longer term and has indeed uh, its, its full place uh, given the deterioration of the of the conditions of, of, um, of human rights defenders. Uh, the, 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 the EU also has um, an emergency fund for human rights defenders um, uh, that we that we have uh, under DEFCO. Um, and very concretely, um, uh, this is um, uh, this is called the, the small grants program, uh, providing different types of very concrete assistance to, to human rights defenders applying. The same as the emergency assistance program that is under Protect Defenders, whether these are legal costs to uh, assist the human rights defenders to challenge uh, some of the violations that they have been going through at the court, whether it's yeah, uh, uh, funding or giving support to psychosocial uh, uh, treatment or, or uh, assistance, uh, whether it's just also support to family members when a human rights defender is, is going through uh, challenging times. So very flexible, and uh, uh, we hear you when uh, uh, we, we you say that there is a need of always ensuring the flexibility to adapt to different situations uh, 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 of, of human rights defenders that they have to face. And then uh, you, of course, have something going beyond the emergency assistance and the short term, like uh, uh, immediate assistance on a, on, a, on, a, on a very short period, but also medium term and long term uh, support, which is uh, embodied also by Protect Defenders that that EU, uh, whether it is um, uh, sometimes a lifeline support to some organizations facing very restrictive conditions. Um, uh, whether uh, uh, it is a, a relocation grant on the longer term uh, or, or uh, building capacities of human rights defenders to help them 
kind of, uh, uh, let's say, face the challenge on the longer term, whether it's a security training to take care of themselves, whether it's um, uh, uh, assisting them to, to act in network with other human rights defenders, whether it's to boost their advocacy and, and uh, uh, other, other human rights work capacities. So um, it's very important that the EU is trying to look on the long term uh, when, when uh, uh, attempting to, to uh, when engaging in favor of human rights defenders. Um, uh, you may have also heard of, of the global and local calls for proposals that are uh, specifically designed to support the work of human rights defenders at the global and local level. Our EU delegations also have an important role on the ground in uh, helping uh, uh, human rights defenders, uh, 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 enabling them to do their work and in, in uh, trying to protect them. Uh, uh, in front of the different challenges they face. So, uh, as a priority for the future, um, we think that it's important that the EU stays engaged <laughs> and continues, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, to, 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 to support these different mechanisms and the, the, the protection uh, for human rights defenders through these different concrete tools. Um, it's also important to maybe think further in terms of uh, 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 tailored assistance and relation with women human rights defenders. Um, I think that's hearing more and more about uh, some specifics that, that, uh, that also they, change, they, they face in their situation. Uh, it's important to, to make that, that reflection and, um, and also to make sure that, that um, uh, women human rights defenders are empowered beyond their local networks uh, to benefit from uh, the different protection programs or, or, or tools that, that, uh, that exist. So, uh, job ahead. Um, thank you so much, Christine, and uh, for, for being, uh, for your ongoing support and for being our champion. Um, you know, I'm sure the context in which you work is not always easy to, but yeah, thank, thanks a lot. Um, um, so I want to make sure that we do have time for uh, questions. Uh, Javier, if I can get your assistance in collecting questions, yeah. Um, but um, I do have a couple of questions um, that I wanted to ask um, our panelists, um, and um, maybe we can do that quickly. But uh, following up on Christine's um, presentation, I wanted to ask, we are um, in the context of you know ongoing conflict in the MENA region. Um, um, what um, what do you think the EU can do better like, to support uh, women in the MENA region? Um, thank you, Maria. Um, actually, I had some notes while Christine was speaking, <laughs> and if you may allow me to to um, to. Um, Tell you some of these notes. Um, so I, I think it's really essential to acknowledge the role of women human rights defenders, not only as uh, women activists who are defending women's rights, but their rights uh, in sustaining uh, development and peace, um, as well as combating uh, radicalism and fundamentalism in MENA region. Um, so I think we should um, consider prioritizing their protection on every EU development agenda. Um, I think also we need to acknowledge the rights of women to be deciding on their own protection priorities. Um, um, development goals should transcend to include protection of women, not only as uh, in terms of um, gender equality, GBV, but also um, on a wider range, considering the wider range of threats that have been uh, targeted, uh, targeted uh, subjected to. Um, such as the displacement, migration, exile, and what comes with them, um, as well as uh, other unconventional uh, types of targeting, such as defamation, online targeting, um, and their effects on well-being and mental health of women human rights defenders. Um, also, I think it's very important to, um, um, to include, as we said before, to include women in designing the processes and uh, including policies and strategies on protection of women human rights defenders, 
but without burdening these women with answering the whole protection question. Um, I think the resources um, pertaining to protection of uh, women human rights defenders should avoid using lofty, um, broad, complicated words um, and manuals because um, they won't be really useful on a grassroots level. Um, most of the time when we approach women with such manuals and, and resources, they need more explanation in order to, um, to, to come um, with the sufficient training for the women on, on the local level. Um, and I think also um, we need to acknowledge the, the urgency of certain protection measures, like sometimes women need to be, um, to be uh, having certain types of responsive, very urgent kind of protection, <laughs> such as funding, relocation, um, but also we need to, um, to acknowledge that we need a long time preventative measures um, in order to protect these women. Um, I think we need also to invest in consolidating women's network um, instead of creating new ones. Um, a lot of organizations are working on creating women's network because networking proved to be very efficient in terms of protection. But why we're creating more networks, why we can't consolidate those existing. Um, and also funding is a very important part of these networks and their um, uh, sustainability and maintaining their work. And finally, I think we need probably to highlight um, the, um, the moral responsibilities and the duties of the member states of the EU in terms of pressuring, electing, and um, using their diplomatic spaces in a very efficient way. Hint, uh, electing Saudi Arabia as um, an executive uh, council of, uh, of the UN CSW. Um, so they'll be focusing on promoting gender equality and empowerment of women, while there is a huge crackdown on women's rights in Saudi Arabia, in fact. And they'll be effective until 2000, um, uh, 2021. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you, Wayam. Um, um, I uh, do want to ask one question um, that I think is important in terms of the patterns that we observe uh, when we're talking about protection for women human rights defenders. Is one of them is that. Um, I think sometimes the tendency that women from more established organizations or from urban uh, areas are more likely to access support, uh, you know, especially if they speak English, um, uh, they're computer savvy, etc., or they're very visible. Um, uh, often there is easier to, to you know, to get um, access to funding or evacuate quickly. Um, but I had a question for Emily is when we're talking about uh, rural women, women in rural areas or from, uh, from other marginalized communities, including indigenous women, uh, where often uh, evacuation is uh, not an option or is not a choice, uh, it's not something they want. And so what, uh, what can we do to, to make sure that they are uh, able to access support and and like how to improve those processes for them. Yes, thank you. Um, I think it's really important the point you are raising that in you know, relocation, I want to say, it, it's always the last, the last of the options, really. It, it should not be the, the, the protection measure you, you promote because it's, well, obviously it's, it's really, uh, it has a, a great impact on the women human rights defender, on her family and her defense, and even more when you talk about community defenders. And in the case of Oaxaca, it's really obvious in cases of women uh, defending land and territory. And when women defend land and ter territory, the the defense is really linked to their identity, to their spirituality, to their community, and so. Uh, Asking them to leave the territory is really, uh, it, it's not an option, even when uh, 
life is in is at risk. It's it's really really complex to well, to, to 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 look for this option. It, it is really a, when there is no other option. It's when you 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 think about relocation. Some of the experience we had on measures that that might be a, um, that might work in those contexts is that and as I was saying before in when you think about the, the attacks, you must look on what is the aggressor looking for. And in the cases of communities, we, we've, we've seen, and as Egerim was, was mentioning too, that defamation is one of the, the most used attacks against uh, women, human and defenders, specifically in community context. The, the Facebook and social networks are really so much used to delegitimize the work of the women human defenders. They, sometimes it's really like something so obvious and so uh, you think, okay, this might not, this will never work, but the impact on the image of the women human defender in the community is really huge when there is a picture of her face with a naked body and some authority also with naked body in, in the bed. And, and for her, it's so uh, well. It 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 will uh, destroy her image in the community. So one of the measures that we saw was working, and and as uh, uh, William was saying, that there is no receipt, and maybe this might work in this context and not in another. But uh, uh, public uh, apologies. Sometimes it's something that not uh, does not need funding but is really uh, effective. Also, um, having like a radio program on the work of the women human rights defenders that, that, has a, a, that, 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 that might be listened to in the community is, is, is something that also um, works, works good. I, I could talk a, a lot more, but I, I understand there is no time, but we, we might uh, have a chat afterwards. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to um, try to summarize some of the questions. Um, I think they're really good. Um, some are very, um, you know, we, could, we had a spare um, two hours, so we could continue. Um, but so there's one question on um, what are we missing and uh, what are the current gaps in the existing support available? So everything that Protect Defenders does already, or other organizations. Um, the question to our activists here is, uh, what are some things that are still missing in terms of support? Maybe a green? Mm -hmm. um, thank you for the question. Um, my answer would be, uh, well, since we are sitting here in Brussels at the European Development Days, and, um, having um, officials sitting along the panel, I would just say that we talk about human rights defenders and support, and including women human rights defenders. I think uh, we, we often uh, talk about uh, of human rights defenders as, uh, as victims, <laughs> so, um, and um, those who needed to be uh, helped and assisted, but in this discourse, we lose uh, the sight of the perpetrator, <laughs> the, the, the perpetrating states. So, um, yeah, so a lot of the mechanisms are designed for the human rights defenders as, you know, that the victims and perpetrator um, relationship is kind of like uh, dismantle because there's so much focus on the defenders but not on the perpetrator and what I would invite the <laughs> officials who actually have access, direct access to the uh, space um, to put the agenda of human rights defenders including women human rights defenders and human rights as a cornerstone to every <laughs> every treaty, every uh, negotiation, every talk. Um, and then, um, yeah, because all the governments, they do have, they do those negotiations, they do sign the development agendas, they put, they, they sign them, they take their obligation. Um, yeah, 
I think we need to put the focus on the perpetrator and and I think that you are the ones who actually have the access because a lot of things we do it actually goes after we go through the loop so we to, to access the government we need to come to Brussels or to Geneva so that our voices are heard so uh, for those who actually have a direct access I would invite them to put this on every table of negotiation. Um, I think I've already mentioned that there are a lot of things that we can do um, and there are a lot of things that are missing um, and one of them probably is um, it's, it's very important to work collectively um, and, and the entities who are working on protecting women human rights defenders are to be complementing each other instead of competing with each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is one of the things I think is very important. And the, the other thing is the long-term um, um, planning. Yeah, I was um, just based on uh, what I'm hearing with the women I work with, um, uh, what happens is when we support, for example, evacuation, um, often there isn't a um, kind of long-term strategy for what happens after she leaves. Um, often in the context of um, uh, a country where you don't speak the language, um, even if there's funding to survive for the next six months or even a year, um, there's a lot of trauma. Um, there's a lot of need for psychosocial support, um, finding community, and if you happen to be uh, an LGBT person, uh, finding your community is not a choice because you're trying to avoid them as well uh, because of homophobia. Uh, so what we're seeing is uh, the need to, to for funding for long-term uh, retreat, uh, retreat centers uh, or networks that exist there to receive the activists. Uh, because often, again, what happens after is, is sort of not always prioritized. Um, so maybe one more question. Um, so in the context of uh, shrinking civic space, um, and when we're talking about um, women human rights defenders and feminist organizations in general, and how they're attempting to disrupt power structures, uh, how, what... Um, what do women human rights defenders and their organizations need to maintain their vision? So their, their strategic thinking, their, their dreaming, um, as opposed to filling the void uh, which is not filled by the state. And the way I understand the question is um, sort of constantly fighting against, constantly providing services, constantly um, replacing the, the, the very things that should be provided by um, others, um, and yet how do you continue visioning, so how do you not forget to dream? Yeah, yeah such an inspiring question. Um, I think, and one of the experience we have is that um, it is really important to, to be able to, to stop sometimes, because one of the basic characteristics of activism, and more when you know, of women activists is that you never stop. You are all the time busy, you are all the time uh, solving this problem, the other problem, the problem in your house, the problem uh, at work, and, and you have like responsibility to, to never stop. And one way of being able to, to keep a thinking out of the box and visioning is, is to stop and, and, and take the time to create. No? And I, I want to also tell you here, I've got some, some information only in Spanish, uh, unfortunately, about a project we have uh, in the Mesoamerican Initiative and with Consortia. It's, it's a house uh, for women human rights defenders when they are in burnout situation, when they are uh, facing extreme uh, stress, to be able to, to, to take 10 days to, to stop for a while. And one thing that we are seeing when those days are organized is that the first day the women come, it's like they, they, they don't know what to do without the computer, without the, the mobile phone and so no, because you are so used to be solving problems all the time that, that you don't have the space to think, to, to be able to, 
but to construct, to vision, to be, uh, to think out of the box, as I was, as I was mentioning. So I think uh, giving uh, the the possibilities to to stop for one hour in the day and do some creative activity, like artistic activity, whatever uh, helps you, like a uh, walking also, physical activity, is so powerful uh, to keep visioning. Um, I think I can do one more question, um, and the question is for Christine, I think. <laughs> Um, how can the EU uh, provide support uh, financially and in terms of uh, capacity and other um, for organizations that are not registered? Thank you. Uh, I mentioned previously the European Instrument for Democracy and Human Rights, which is a, a very interesting instrument for um, the human rights civil society actors. Uh, because it is uh, having several features, including flexibility and including the ability to uh, work with non-registered organizations. So, um, uh, under this financial instrument, uh, as I mentioned, Protect Defenders of the EU is, 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 uh, is uh, funded, but uh, uh, EIDHR acronym funding is also available on the ground through um, the, the EU delegations. So indeed, everything is not concentrated in Brussels, but is also uh, very much and increasingly uh, used by uh, our colleagues and our delegations on the ground. So uh, I encourage uh, different uh, uh, human rights defenders and non-registered uh, human rights organizations to uh, engage a dialogue and to, and to see how, how they could partner and work uh, with the EU funding under this uh, flexible and uh, very appropriate instrument. So, um, actually, my colleagues are protect defenders. So you raise your hand, so you're, yeah. So uh, these are the folks that are doing amazing work, protecting, uh, providing support for um, defenders around the world. Um, we're at time. So um, I want to uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. I hope you found this panel informative. Thank you, amazing panelists, for being here. And uh, yeah, thank, thank you very much.